women in expensive clothes, women in legal brothels, and at the truck stops where sex is sold for $10. And what do they tell you about what it's like to be here? You're just so ashamed of yourself. It's like a tattoo. It'll never go away. You might get it lasered off, but there's always going to be traces of it there. We've learned that 60 to 90 percent of female prostitutes were abused. Many have been homeless, virtually all of them in danger. There's been studies about mortality rates of women in the sex industry. The range is high as up to 120 times more likely to be murdered. Nick Kristoff reports about trafficking for the New York Times. Do you think America is in denial about the amount of it? I think we're in denial, and I think one reason for that denial is that overwhelmingly the victims are poor. But we have also learned that a girl next door, a college student, can be lured into prostitution in small increments by a pimp who pretends to be a boyfriend. It's as if they're training you like a dog. And yet in America, the women go to jail while pimps and traffickers often escape. So do the clients. It's something I can't explain. I wish I could, all right? I'm always scared to death I'm going to lose my girlfriend. You will meet the legal prostitutes in the brothels. He told me that, you know, I could make a good living out here. And before you make up your mind, hear from a woman who says she chooses a handful of clients herself who pay her hundreds of thousands of dollars. For her, it is liberation. I just don't, I don't believe it. Well, if, if I'm unhappy, I stop. Her challenge, ask yourself what you do for money. Which is worse, what you do or marrying someone for their money? Tonight, the reality of women and prostitution in America. Good evening again, I'm Diane Sawyer. And as we said, it was two years ago that we began traveling the country to take a look at the real dimensions of prostitution in America. The numbers and the human beings involved. And when the news broke about Governor Spitzer of New York, it catapulted questions into the news about the differences between women in the high end of the business and the low, legal brothels to the streets, and what it really is to call this kind of sex consensual. Another warning, now that it's later in the evening, some of the material is more graphic. And on this Good Friday, when many of us are pondering questions of blame and choice and redemption, we begin by looking more closely at what the women actually do every day and what that means for body and soul. Two years ago, outside Philadelphia, we climb aboard a local health outreach van which offers food, clothing, condoms, and HIV testing to street prostitutes. The ones who live in that barely visible underworld. One guy wanted me to spit in a jar and he would drink it. The more spit in a jar, the more money I would get. There's always danger every time you get into the car. You get raped, you get killed, you have know, all different types of people out here. It is still early morning, a weekday. We're surprised to see the girls are already out, that business is already booming. So this is a good time of day. I'm still stunned. Here it is a weekday. One girl, before she talks to us, vanishes toward the car around the corner. Her name is Skylar. She's going to see a regular. She'll be back to meet with us in a moment. But this is her friend Jessica. Is that one of her regulars? Yeah. yeah. So want to come on in and talk? Jessica is age 24 from Tennessee. She says she started with marijuana young, then moved on to other drugs. She, her husband, and her heroin habit came to Philadelphia, and she says she made a promise to herself about prostitution. And of course, I was, oh, I'll never end up on Broadway. I'll never be on Broadway. Not me. It took about a week. <laughs> the husband left. The addiction did not. It requires about $250 a day, which she earns on the most dangerous street in town. Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, I got robbed at gunpoint, beat in the head with a gun. I've been stabbed. Stabbed? Oh, God. Well, I was 127 stitches. That was about five months ago. She says she has three to four clients a day. Mostly, she says, they ask for oral sex with the occasional twisted specialty. But when I first started working out here, he used to come up all the time and ask the girls if they'd step on a baby kitten for him. While he f***ed off. I hate myself every day for doing this. 
but once you're in it, it's a lot harder to get out of than you would think. Could you go back home, live with your grandmother? I can't go down there like this. And I've put her through so much stuff. I'm sorry. What's the hardest part physically? The hardest part? Having to be me when it's all done. At this point, her friend Skylar comes back. She is 25, another heroin addict. She made a few bucks while we were waiting. How much money did you make? $20. It was only gone, what, four minutes? <laughs> so, it's not too bad. It was oral sex. And then he's gone. Yep. So what do you think about when you're doing this? I just count. <laughs> While I'm winning it, I count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I don't know why, but it's just, I got something to refocus my attention. And we learned that even the girls on the toughest street still try to hold on to some border, some boundary, just for themselves. I won't have sex with money. Not, never? No never. matter what they offer? I never have. I never have. I never will. You know, I told myself I'll never do heroin. Oh, I'll never give somebody a no, I do. I did all of it. I did all of it. But the one thing that I won't cross, that one line I will not cross, I will not get on my back for money. I hate sex. The thought of it makes me want to throw up. Because? I never, while I was growing up, said, gee, when I grow up, I want to stick myself with a needle and for money, <laughs> you know? She told us something so horrible, so traumatizing happened to her as a child, she can't even talk about it. What is the answer for you? I don't know. I think it may be death. She tells us, by the way, that she's a college graduate. She studied music. I majored in fine arts, theater. I sing opera. So, you do? Yes, I do. What will it take for you to change the life that you can change? I don't know. Maybe watching this one, it airs. There's one of my regulars right there. Yeah. <laughs> Where? Right there. In that car? Yep. Who is he? What His is he? His name is Jim. Him right there, it's a forty dollar date. Before yeah. she goes back to work, you, you a request. Would you sing something for me? Sure. How about something from the family opera? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. My time sharpens, heightens each sensation. Darkness stirs and wakes imagination. Silently the senses abandon their defenses. It's beautiful. Thanks. Really beautiful. Ashley Dupre, the Pulp Fiction name in the headlines with the former governor of New York, who was billed by the agency a difficult client. Her real age, 22 years old, though the Escort website said she was a 24-year-old patron of fine wines. She was also billed on the site as a successful swimsuit model, but in fact, she was an aspiring singer and cocktail waitress. Was she another girl enticed by the pretty woman fantasy? The cultural conspiracy to make a little prostitution seem like an adventure? Or was there serious sexual abuse in her past? Former prostitute Danielle says it can't be a simple story. Have you ever met anyone who is happy doing it? Never. So when you read about Ashley Dupre, that portrait painted of her. This is her way out. So I'm almost happy that she got caught. Why are you speaking with us? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and with all the women we met in this story, there was only one who challenged us on every assumption about cost and suffering, working in the sex trade. You're looking at someone who hopes you will never know if she's your best friend, your co-worker. What can we tell you about her? She's beautiful, highly educated. She works in the arts, not a high-paying field. 
but she has a second career and a double life, answering only to herself. She says she's not a call girl. She does not work for an escort service. She says the men who come to her are among the wealthiest in the country. And they are only there because she decides to accept them. Her term for herself is from another century. Courtesan, uh, which is a, a term I, I hate because it feels to me very anachronistic. How many clients do you choose then? A uh, total right now, I'd say I have about seven. Are they married mostly? Most of them, yes. Why do they come to you? The vast majority, I would say, come to me because they miss the intimacy in their personal relationships. And it's not, I see people uh, simplify it to, to sex, that they're not having sex with their wives. And I don't think it's that. I think many of these men crave physical contact. I think there's also a desire for adventure, a desire for even secrecy. I mean, what's difficult for me, maintaining these secrets, I think for them, it's very exciting. Um, well, they, they tell me so much. It's very exciting to have a secret mistress. What she offers, she says, is like the first flush of attraction with all its sensuality and attention. She just offers it every time, over and over again. How much are you faking? A sexual experience is something I care about a great deal. So faking it or any sort of theatrics, to me, diminishes the, the experience. So what you do for them, you're saying, is not exotic stuff? It's just what? kind of wish it were exotic. Um, no, it's very similar to maybe very sexual long-term relationships. They're paying money to enter into a relationship rather than for a sex act. She says she stepped into the ambiguous twilight of selling sex six years ago when a man she was seeing said he had a proposition. She could continue to work in the low-paying job she loved, and he could have her body and time, no complications on either side. He essentially said outright that he was married. So in lieu of commitment, he um, said he could offer me money. And he knew that I was um, in a situation where I needed financial help. And how did you feel at that moment? Liberated, <laughs> I mean, for better or for worse. It simplified it to this very clear exchange of needs. And, and I'm also a very sexual person. Yes, but there's something different, isn't there? I mean, it can be a sexual person and at the same time really value the sanctity of your own body. I don't see the introduction of a transaction or, or money as decreasing the sanctity of value of my, my body. And so she says she selected a few other clients. How much does she make? She wouldn't disclose it, but said her clients are very generous in gifts, jewelry, money. We have no way to corroborate her story. When I see them, they just give me an envelope or a bag or something, and I put it aside, and then I don't think about it, and we just talk and go from there. I could easily make several hundred thousand a year. She says she was once offered an exclusive contract by a client. Came up with a number, and the number was 2.9 million for one year. She turned him down. Which brings us back to our main question. I don't want to be dependent on any person. If I were to take just a single patron, there would be so many conditions so that could preserve my sense of independence and, um, and freedom. But in some way, this is a moral choice, isn't it? Right. There are plenty of places to work and make extra money. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, you said that there are, there are many other jobs we can take um, that essentially serve the same purpose. And, I mean, one often uses the term to prostitute oneself to these other jobs. I do that literally, but I don't see it as any different. Which is worse, what you do or marrying someone because they have money? Well, for myself, um, I, can't, I can't imagine marrying somebody for their money. Is there nothing you feel you're giving away? Nothing you feel you're no, selling that shouldn't be sold? She says in every way she feels true to herself, but she also knows the reality. There are a lot of negatives, plenty of negatives. Like that. terrified you'll be found out at work? Yeah, yeah, terrified by that. Um, there are many levels of fear. Um, I mean, foremost, the being outed, um, being blackmailed, um, having a client who isn't stable, uh, which I've encountered. Um, I've been put under surveillance a number of times by clients who are just 
want to make sure I'm not talking, I assume. I don't want to know more about me. It's very exhausting. Exhausting to have one relationship that's one-sided, so to have seven or five or two, um, tremendously exhausting. What's the hardest part? It's very easy to become very lonely when you know that you are, to a certain extent, disposable. I know that if I were in trouble, that they couldn't protect me and they wouldn't protect me. You know, I just am having a really hard time believing that there isn't suffering in you. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't believe it. Well, if I'm unhappy, I stop. Were you abused as a child? No. Teenager? No. Drugs? No. Emotional problems? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I do. I am afraid to be vulnerable. Hurt badly? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Early on in life? I have. Um, and I'm fully aware that I am, that I'm being a wuss, sort of emotional wuss. It's significantly easier to have multiple um, distant relationships rather than one very close relationship. It's much easier for me to, to not be vulnerable. And I know it's not ideal. If someone asked me what would get me to stop, um, it, would, it would be love and a genuine desire for a monogamous relationship. And before we leave her, a final question about the governor, who has been so much in the news. We saw that phrase, difficult clients. What yeah. does that signal to you? <laughs> it signals a lot. I saw quite a bit of speculation about condom use and, and so right. forth and sex acts. It usually does not refer to um, a, a sexual issue or even a danger issue. It's usually a personality thing. Um, if someone is deeply neurotic, sometimes, rarely, but sometimes it refers to client who maybe has a um, unusual um, kink that, but more often you, you wouldn't say difficult client, you'd say this person has a very unusual taste for things. Would you advise Mrs. Spitzer to stay with him? Well, uh, no, but not, not for sleeping with a prostitute, for being a hypocrite. I think that's my issue with it. We are back at the Bunny Ranch, one of Nevada's 30 legal brothels, where all those girls greet the clients with all those smiles. But the beating heart of the ranch okay. is the cashier's office. Four hand to the bar. Uh, you can come in here if you want. Good evening, world famous Bunny Ranch. Glenda, who watches the clock, once worked as a nanny. How do you time how long they've been in? How do you know? See, like this lady here just booked for X number of dollars, and she tells mm -hmm. me how long she's going to be in the room with that gentleman. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I set the clock for that many minutes, and when it goes off, you tell her it's time to reparty. Every kind of client, every kind of request. There's guys that come in here and want me to pretend like I'm, you know, their 12-year-old daughter, and to call them daddy and them spank them. The men with, like, the high-profile, high-pressure jobs and usually the kinkiest. My first um, client basically likes to hump your leg. Couples come here. 90-year-old men come in here. Women come here. 18-year-old men come in here. Everybody comes here, not just men. Dennis Hoff, the owner, gives the team a pep talk. Fulfill those fantasies. Be that e-ticket Disneyland fantasy experience, you know, and, and create them, and, and you'll be rewarded handsomely you have a six-figure income, and you'll live happily ever after. One of the girls, Shelly, and the client demonstrate for us how the negotiations tend to proceed. My rates are two thousand an hour for everything except thousand for half an hour, fifteen minutes for five hundred. But cool guys like you. Yeah. Um, what if I make you forget how long the time is? Yeah, I was thinking you seem pretty neat, and. Uh, I don't always stick to my prices. As we said earlier, Dennis takes half the money each girl earns and collects rent and a fee for food. He also brings in Katrina, an unsentimental veteran of the trade, to talk about negotiating with PTs, professional tricks. You know what? I've went in with a hundred dollar party and walked away with thousands. Yeah. Okay. From a PT because he wants to run a game on me. I own my game. 
The girls insist to us that a surprising number of the men come in looking for what's called the GFE, the girlfriend experience. He wants you to be his girlfriend for however long, you know, he booked you for, whether that's 10 minutes or 10 hours. Um, you know, kissing, holding hands, um, you know, cuddling everything. They're so the are you house. thinking the, the majority of them don't want the extreme kinky stuff? No, they don't. No, 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 no it's no, so no. much more than sex. It's so much more than sex. It seemed unbelievable to us that men would pay thousands at a brothel just for conversation. Then we met Robert. Well, you ever fought, I know, it's a good start. I don't care less about sex. I just want someone to hang on to and watch fights and watch a movie and live the cowboy life and you'll understand. It's lonely. What made him choose this girl? First I look at the teeth and, and if she got pretty teeth and I go from there. She's so kind. I hugged her and she hugged me and that was the way it was. Not a big deal. And I was happy. Jackson! Because when he's laying here and he's like... And what's the story behind Max, who is a kind of legend here? Max, the prostitute with the soft heart for stray dogs, says she's the biggest earner at the ranch. Service of a smile. <laughs> she showed us Louis Vuitton clothes, the million-dollar house she's building. And she wants to talk about her plans, her architects, her landscaping. And then I go to Vegas and I build this. Good heavens, it's beautiful. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. You built it? Yeah, off the ground. She uses the <laughs> internet to draw clients to the ranch. So far this month, I have 286,500 hits. And her sexual Move secret? To We're told cheek. nothing Remember. exotic, just being accessible <laughs> and fun. I'm going to take a bath. I just wanted to say good morning. But we had the same question for her. Who did Max used to be back before prostitution, when sex was still a feeling? and a gateway to love. You were saying to somebody, I did it because, you know, instead of becoming a real estate agent, I did it because... I did it because I needed to get things in order in my life fast. Money um, or... Financial, other. a lot of things like that. I just gotten divorced. Another story of a bruising divorce. I didn't marry someone for money and I didn't take any money when I left. So. That's hard, it's scary. It's weird to think about it sometimes. To think about? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> mm. I think I've had enough right now. Okay, you bet. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. yeah. You sure? Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Don't. Okay, sorry. It's crazy. The doorbell rings, one of Max's regular customers. He says his wife approves. I've been married for, you know, for 25 years to the most wonderful woman on the face of the earth because I love her and because when I met her, I couldn't help but love her. And it's the same with Max. And sometimes when I look at her, when I listen to her, when I watch her, I, I see myself, if I were, as I told her, if I were a lot younger, female, and a hell of a lot better looking. We are told he is paying her $20,000 to spend an entire night with him. 17000 on credit card and yes, three on cash. Okay, our work's done here. It's a lot of money raising again those questions about trade-offs in the legal sex world, where you get health protection. Do the advantages make legal prostitution just another job? I think we have this sort of happy hooker or pretty girl model that we think of, and that's because the women who sell sex, it works if you're selling to look happy, uh, not to be crying. At breakfast the next morning, the sleepy girls laughingly drop the pretense that the sexual interest they show in the men is real. You don't mean you're faking it. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I just keep thinking the dollar signs, and I just get so excited, I start shaking. But perhaps the biggest surprise for us was that the most cynical take from the women was for the Richard Gere of the world, as portrayed in Pretty Woman. Is everybody's dream, though, still that the guy comes in with gobs of money and says, stop doing this? Not here. Never. Nobody you've met here made you love them? Nobody? Nobody. No. Nobody. No. No. 
Good evening, my friend is Bunny Ranch. The girls laughingly say they even have a name for those guys. Captain Save-A-Ho. The cashier follows up with a brittle joke. I love it, these guys come in here thinking they're gonna find a wife, because they think they'll get a every day. And like I've heard, you know why there's such a beautiful smile on a bride's face? She's thinking to herself, oh, I'll never ever give a as long as I live. Next. Good evening, world famous Bunny Ranch. And finally, what about something we know is pervasive in the world of prostitution? Something only whispered about at the ranch, though one of the girls confided to us what we couldn't see about drugs. A lot of the girls here do do drugs, whether it's illegal drugs on the street, coke and ecstasy and all that stuff, or whether it's prescription drugs. Was taking Xanax, you know, three or four Xanax a day, you know, to get through, or no Valiums. Drugs, she says, to numb you, help you get through the day. You have to be numb to be here. Exactly. Max, the superstar, and Becca, the preacher's daughter from rural Louisiana, Becca, who came to the ranch at the age of 19, make a video diary. They gave it to us. Hello. Welcome to the bedroom. Welcome to the Becca and Max, or the Max and Becca show. Otherwise the known as, equal. Otherwise <laughs> known as live in the broth. You would just love it. Love it. If I was just the perfect little Stepford hooker. <laughs> Wait. Is that the shrink? Becca has just taken a hit of ecstasy. She has struggled with addiction in the past, and here she's doing a dance of drugs and confusion. It was because I felt so just ugh about life that I took this that I took this pill. Now I feel great. Later, we hear Dennis sent Becca to a rehab facility and eventually hired her back. <laughs> for every woman in the business, there is a cautionary tale not far away. For instance, we met a homeless 19-year-old who says she's teetering whether to turn her first trick. I mean, yeah, you get money, you know. All I hear about is like, oh, you get so much money, you can make so much bucks, but I just couldn't do it. It's like a moral thing. I couldn't just walk up to a complete stranger. I, it would scare me. <laughs> All she needs of reality is in the face that looks back at her, a veteran prostitute, Marley, who has temporarily given her shelter in a motel room to protect her from the danger of the street. I'm 53 years old. You know, I'm sure she's sitting back thinking, God, is this what I want to do? Do, do I want to be Marley in 30 years? That's not it. No, but I no. just don't want to be a prostitute. I don't want to do that. That's right. Because really, she's such a good person. I mean, she took me in. I have nothing. I'm having to start crying out. She's seriously like a mom to me. While we're talking with the two women, they learn they're getting their eviction notice from the motel manager. Are you asking me to leave right now? She's helping me to think that this isn't right. Oh, we should live like this. Love you, Mom. <laughs> Back in the outreach van, where they travel the streets giving prostitutes HIV tests and condoms, we head into the roughest part of town where the prostitutes serve the truckers as the truckers drive through. This is like the bottom of the line, you know, this is, this is where they end up at. Then another circle of hell? Exactly. It is freezing cold. Many of the women live in what are called abandos, abandoned houses, no heat, electricity, or running water, sometimes using bathtubs as latrines. Yeah, the bathroom's right in your face right here. <laughs> Don't do it, he said. <laughs> There it goes. That's better than most. Shoot, some of them, they just go to the bathroom right on the floors. The city tries to board up the buildings. The women show us how they simply come in the roof or the windows. So what they have to do is they have to come down from the inside of this building, climb out the window, and walk next door to apartments. But climbing up on the roofs to get in the houses and then get down. Yeah, yeah I see them come through quite a few times. Boy, that's dangerous. We're told that some of the women who work here are now willing to sell sex for $5, but no one would admit that to us. No one admitted a price lower than 10. 
And if, say, they want to go down 10, and they wanted you to do it for 10, the only thing you do is get, get for $10, that's it. Next door, we meet Beth, age 45, homeless for 14 years. Hey, nice Beth. Nice to meet you. Welcome nice to meet you. Kind of cold. Aren't you all cold in here? Very cold. I mean, what's it like in a couple of hours in here? It must be below zero. Yes, it is. But before you make up your mind about who she used to be, you should know that Beth grew up in a middle-class suburb in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. What was life like before? What, before I came here? Yeah. Um, I lived in Brooklyn, and I was the boss at the Days Inn. There used to be a bag lady that was in Cherry Hill. My worst fear ever in life was that I was going to turn out like her. And in, in a way, I did. But I also believe that everything that happens in your life is already planned. Now, her abando is a refuge for other prostitutes yeah. who can find no safe place to sleep. It's, it's very hard. A lot of people don't understand what we go through. We go through a lot. Will you be going out tonight? Of course, if not, <laughs> we'll survive. That's what we might find now. A strange friendship community on the edge of survival. I miss my kids. And I can't get them back. Whatever you feel about prostitution and about these women themselves, it's hard to argue that so many of them left in the shadows do not need help. And that there's a kind of denial in the country about the sheer numbers and the dangers. So we set out to answer another question. What changes things? Does anything anywhere work to save lives? America criminalizes prostitution with some of the toughest laws on the books in the Western world, yet it hasn't stopped the sex trade. And as we said, in this country, most of those who are sent to jail are women who can't turn to police when they're in danger because they could be arrested for prostitution. Around the globe, another approach has emerged. In much of Europe, parts of South America, in New Zealand, they've been moving towards some form of legalization but the kind of legalization seems to matter. Let's start with the Netherlands, which has a long history of legalization for client and prostitutes, but with worrying results. The Netherlands has become a kind of mecca for organized criminal traffickers who love the open sex market. Nick Kristoff says the more promising model might be Sweden. Sweden allowed the women to sell sex, but they made it illegal to buy sex. And in other words, they cracked down on the male customers. And they also cracked down on the trafficking. The result? The traffickers are going elsewhere, worried about getting caught. And instead of sending struggling women to jail, the men who pay for the sex are also paying the legal price. So if Governor Spitzer had been caught in Sweden, he would face up to six months in jail. And Ashley Dupre would have received help with what's called the exit strategy, counseling, job training, and support for going back to school. Is there any chance of that kind of change being made in the U.S.? Well, an irony. Governor Spitzer actually uh, did some terrific work um, in prostitution, you know, above board. Like it, which thing? It was an anti-trafficking law uh, in New York, which really uh, set some important things in motion. And one of those was to look more at the Johns. What do you make of that psychology in him? Governor Spitzer, the last time I saw him, I encouraged me to write about prostitution and his work on the field. And, you know, that was just such an astonishing act of bravado and chutzpah, considering what we know of him now. I mean, my suspicion is that in his mind, he did distinguish between what was going on in the streets where pimps were controlling 14-year-old girls, which he was aghast at, and what he saw as voluntary transactions between consenting adults, which is probably for how money. he saw his for money, which is presumably how he saw Thanks. Ashley. Uh, some of the experts wonder, did the governor ask Ashley's age or if she'd been abused or homeless? And what about whether she had guarantees, ordinary protection, like other jobs? We don't let people work for $2 an hour at McDonald's because we think that that is bad public policy because it's demeaning. We don't let window washers work without safety harnesses. But besides changing the law, what else can change prostitution? Well, fashion. 
if I remember right, about half of men in 1950 um, patronized prostitutes. Now that gets about 20 percent. Because of the liberal sexual culture in the country? I think one is that there's more promiscuity generally. I think another is that going to brothels now is increasingly perceived among men as not something that is cool, but is something for people who've kind of failed in the marketplace and that it is uh, demeaning, uh, that it is inappropriate. Are men ever going to stop going to prostitutes? We're not going to eliminate prostitution in America or anywhere else, but I think one can manage it substantially better so that you don't have 14-year-old girls who were taken away at bus stations and ended up on the streets. Danielle, that college student who says she wandered in too deep. To the people out there who say these girls are what? Sluts. You have to be contemptuous of these girls who make this decision because they can do other things. What do you want to say to them? There's a saying that you can't turn a whore into a housewife. I totally disagree. Um, I've never cheated, nor will I, on my husband. And I, you're the same girl. And I'm the same girl that was promiscuous in my adolescence. Uh, became a prostitute, but it's all about self-esteem and self-control. We should be able to recognize that everybody in this country, um, let alone in other countries, is not equal, right? We're created equal, but we don't come into equal circumstances or, or equal privilege or equal power or equal class status. And so recognizing that choices are very different for different people and options are very different. Uh, I think compassion is probably a better role for us than condemnation and maybe more than compassion or condemnation uh, you know some kind of intervention to help these women we decided to check back on some of the women you've met in the course of this last hour women we followed for more than two years first the bunny ranch Shelly, the former real estate agent, left the brothel. I don't want people to think that I'm a bad person. But she returned to the ranch just a few months ago. Becca, who made the video on ecstasy, also left and tells us she got married to a boy next door and had a baby. Max, who said she was the biggest earner, also left the brothel but decided to return. And Christina, who just wanted to earn money to be a nurse, she left the ranch after a few weeks, but no one has heard from her since. And what about the girls on the street? Jessica, who was stabbed, told us she stayed a few months after our interview, but then did go back to her grandmother. But Skylar, who sang for us, has simply disappeared into the night. While untold thousands of women we did not meet head out into the streets again. I tried briefly to get a regular job and all that, but once you're in the life, it's got a hold on you. We'd like to hear from you, your thoughts about the women, the issues, and what might help. So go to our website, abcnews.com. You'll also find a list of organizations working in the field. And on this Good Friday night, we can't help but think of the story in the New Testament, where the crowd is assaulting a prostitute, and Jesus draws a line in the sand and says, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. I'm Diane Sawyer. For all of us at 2020 and ABC News, good night.